Hello and good evening, everyone, or uh, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, I am Hashi Mohammed, and I have the great pleasure of uh, editing this particular tortoise uh, uh, event titled The Future of Cities. We have a huge amount of uh, materials to get through and a fruitful conversation with very esteemed guests. I uh, have a keen interest in this area. I'm a barrister uh, specializing in particular in planning and environment. So I work in this area pretty much daily and in particular in housing. Although I live in London, one of those big metropolis cities, right now I am uh, speaking to you all from a town called Malmesbury, not far away from Bristol. Um, and so it, it's a real great pleasure to, to be able to host this. So what are we here to discuss today? Well, one of the key things we're here to discuss is about how major cities are going to cope with this issue of the housing crisis. Rising housing prices and rents have forced some people out of cities altogether. We've seen how significant amounts of public and private city housing has been left either completely deteriorating or empty, or sometimes in many cases actually owned by foreign investors and capital markets that we don't much know about. But most people can't or won't leave the cities. And so if they have those deep cultural familial connections, what are they to do? And so I hope that today we'll be trying to tackle some of these points in particular, and how can we create urban homes that are affordable to everyone, but also greener, more beautiful, and better suited to the 21st century living. How much of the existing housing stock can actually be adapted and upgraded, how much of it has been, needs to be built from scratch. So we have four uh, amazing speakers who I will uh, introduce in more detail their credentials uh, as they speak. But the format today will be, I will introduce them each uh, briefly and then ask them to speak to their topic uh, for about five minutes to the topic that we're discussing and then open it up for question and answer session between us uh, for quite some time and also uh, uh, around the, the, uh, the speakers themselves. We have uh, Dr. Deborah uh, Potts, who's the author of Broken Cities Inside the Global housing crisis. We have uh, Smith, Director of Sustainability and Physics at Borough Harpool. We have Agamemnon Otero, the CEO of Energy Garden, co-founder of Repowering Brixton Energy Community Energy England. And finally, we also have Melanie Leach, the Chief Executive of the British uh, Property uh, Federation. So I'm going to start with you, Dr. Deborah Potts, to kind of lay out for us the, 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 where we are at the moment. Give us some context to this discussion in terms of identifying the central issues of the global housing crisis that we are facing, and perhaps with a few examples in relation to the global cities that we are discussing, so that then we can move on to the conversation that we are about to have. Over to you, Dr. Potts. Okay, thank you. Um, and good evening to all of you. And thanks for allowing me to take part in this event and this big question of can we create enough city homes? And it's a question that's been central to my thinking over the past few years and the writing of my cookbook that Hashi Mohammed has very kindly just mentioned, Broken Cities. Um, I would rephrase the question slightly to can we create enough affordable and decent city homes? And I hope the reason for that will become clear as I speak. Uh, I'll leave the important question about how to make them green to those with more expertise than I on that subject. I think the short answer is that yes, we can. It's true today for Singapore, for example, as long as you're a citizen. Uh, in the UK, we've done it before. By the end of the 1970s, there was no great shortage of housing affordable to households right across the income spectrum. But since then, the situation has steadily worsened again. And we do now have a situation seen across the world in both the so-called global south and global north, where the lack of housing affordable to those at the lower end of city income distributions is causing forced movement out of cities and so much misery and suffering for the millions forced to live in inadequate housing and whose rents are so high in relation to their incomes that many cannot afford to cover other basic needs adequately, such as food and heating. 
Now, one of the key arguments I make in my book, uh, and this is a big structural point, is that this situation is in one sense inevitable. I mean, last year, one of the speakers in a tortoise media event on cities was the mayor of Vancouver. And he said that the main thing shaping the possibilities for housing in that city was that it was strapped to capital. And that really is my starting point because the problem of unaffordable housing, in my view, is a chronic condition of large thriving capitalist cities. Uh, and in my view, the primary cause lies not in housing markets, but in labor markets. And that's because in every town and city across the world, there are many people, millions of people across the world working in jobs that do not pay enough to make the rent on decent housing, let alone buy anything. Um, it's what I call the housing dilemma. There's a mismatch between the vast number of jobs which command low incomes and the cost of decent legal housing provided by the private sector. And another way of saying that is that housing markets are segmented. One segment basically cannot afford anything that's profitable for a regulated private sector, no matter how large that supply of that housing is. Now, I'm not saying that the private sector cannot or will not supply housing the poor can't afford, can afford. It does it in cities in the poorer parts of the world. It's done it in the global north in the past. But the quality of that housing can be or has been grossly inadequate for human safety, for health and dignity. And we really don't want to go down there again. Um, so this chronic problem has only ever been overcome by mass government subsidization of private sector rents, whether by building uh, public rental housing or by supporting private rental payments. Now that does give governments a lot of power and that power can and has been abused. Um, but the key point that the private for profit sector can't provide affordable housing for many and sometimes for most remains. And on this, there used to be general agreement. Uh, if one thinks back to the UK and Singapore examples in 79, 1979, 42% of UK households lived in council housing. And in Singapore today, over 80% of households live in housing, which was provided with highly affordable mortgages and constructed by a government entity. This key point has, however, been abandoned over the past 40 years since the shift towards more free market and unregulated economies and the ideology of reducing government intervention. And this has occurred worldwide. I mean, in India, as local housing advocates argue, and again, I quote, social housing programs, always reluctant and faltering, have slowed and now more or less stopped. And as my book, amongst many others, explains, one outcome of deregulation was the massive push by private capital into trying to make more profit by providing essentially unsecured mortgages to households who anyone with a grain of sense could see could not afford them. And that included lending to the so-called ninjas, people with no income, no jobs and no assets. And when the whole thing inevitably came crashing down into 2008, the global capitalist economy nearly collapsed as we all know. And it was only mass government intervention that prevented that collapse. But that was an irony that was far from funny since not only did millions lose their houses, but the vast amount of public cash injected into the markets and the associated really low interest rates meant that investors went on the search for other places to park their money safely. And unfortunately, that was often in large cities' housing markets. Um, and that soon drove up house prices again. And in some cities, such as in this country, in some cities there was a double whammy as austerity measures to try and claw back some of the public money also drove down incomes. We know the outcomes. When you compare data for 2017 with 2007 in the UK, for example, only 22% of households were buying houses in London compared to 36% before. And those renting privately had risen from 19% to 30%. And the problem is worst for the younger urban cohorts. Again, this is a familiar problem. Nearly half of those aged 25 to 34 in England were renting in 2017 compared to only 27% in 2007. 
And there are similar trends clear in the United States. By 2017, for example, the number of households renting was 8.7 million more than in 2006 and the highest recorded since 1965. And my last example today, I read an online article about Lagos, which showed that there even young professionals cannot begin to afford to rent the vast amounts of formal private sector housing being built in that city. So much of it stands empty. And as one young professional lamented, who are they building these houses for? And where do they want people to get the money? So in summary, I think the trajectory of the story of city housing and its affordability for city residents, those people whose work makes the city work, many of whom are low paid, has entered a really new phase in this century. There's always been a struggle over open housing, but the extraordinarily rapid rise in prices, housing prices in this century, in the run up to the financial crash and afterwards, in my view, have truly reshaped the parameters and we now do face a real crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Potts. And um, to just then develop some of that, uh, Agamemnon, could I come to you as somebody who's been obviously working uh, as a CEO of the Energy Garden, co-founder of Reempowering Brixton Energy, Community Energy England. You are somebody who uh, is embedded in the community, has got lots of experience in grassroots uh, uh, works and trying to do as much as you can to make these cities affordable, livable, quality, and, you know, in a way, without being um, sort of, you know, negative about what Dr. Potts said, but Dr. Potts is sort of set out was quite, you know, bleak. And that's the reality of what we're dealing with. So your thoughts on, on some ways out of this. Um, it's been an amazing journey to be able to, to think about this through the lens of the cooperative movement, as opposed to the corporate movement. Um, my work over, I studied math, medicine and architecture. And so my work has really begun to be, how do you structure well-being? And through that, the, the most fascinating piece is that the Rochdale Cooperative that was built in the UK about 200 years ago was how did coal miners come together to fight the incumbent um, uh, property and land barons? And they did it through a one vote, one shareholding piece. And I began 11 years ago to work with local community members on developing uh, solar energy co-ops on the poorest social housing blocks in in London and in the UK. And what ended up happening was not only did it change the way they consumed their energy and they thought about um, their, the, their financial returns, it also changed the way they thought of their physical infrastructure. And they then began to vote differently. They began to come together in a new way. And they also began to think about this, the built environment in a new way. As an architect, one begins to conceive the idea that the, the built environment has so much to do with the user that um, it, it almost becomes a, a silly game to try to build the most perfect sustainable city, you know, smart city, when actually we need socially smart cities. And the only way to do that is through an iterative process. And so through the work that we've been doing um, over the last 10, 11 years, I have developed from the first community energy project on social housing in the UK to the largest, to the first blockchain energy trading project in the world to use a national grid. Um, there's, there's also been the local currencies. We set the Brixton pound where we would actually got 270 different businesses to then take the money that we were generating on these low income social housing places uh, to then facilitate a dynamic dialogue, which and as a, as a practitioner, I think is a really important piece is to highlight is that most of the people that you would assume or who politicians and developers assumed didn't care about the infrastructure of their home, the sustainability of their home, where their energy came from, were actually very much aware that anthropogenic climate change was a reality and that they would choose to have renewable energy and they would choose to have the fabrics of their home and the city around them as in, sustain, in a sustainable way. They just we're not being included in that. So the cooperatives that, that I've been working on developing are now, I've just popped it into the chat there, energygarden.org.uk, has been really about how do you create a citywide, socially smart program for communities to come together and mm -hmm. actually buy the infrastructure around them. The interesting thing that ends up happening is when people do that, they then become involved and engaged with the planning decisions and the infrastructure decisions. And they're not just, we started with energy. I think of solar as like a gateway drug. 
solar gets people excited. We make solar panels. We get everybody um, going with, you know, charging their own phones, using the tabbing water and soldering. But from there, you then learn that you can build the infrastructure, generate the energy, reduce your bills. And then what's next? What can we use this roof for? How can we insulate this building? How can we take our waste and turn it into a biodigester to then generate revenue for the community? You then begin to create a wave, a, a, a positive movement towards facilitating the dynamic change we want to see because consistently government is driven by the you know fiduciary responsibility that is led by the sort of waving sector of of highest return in the shortest amount of time yeah. uh, and that that pushes policy but what ends up happening is that when you can have voters and individual people coming together to say we want a difference we want to change that they then really choose this socially smart city. And to do a just transition, you have to have people embedded in this cooperative movement. And I would, I would urge all of my speakers and all the people listening to, to reflect on that piece, that there is no just transition without rethinking the financial mechanism which drives fiduciary responsibility. Thank you very much. And I'd be very interested to know uh, what Dr. Potts' thoughts are on that as well in just a moment. But to, to, to Smith, um, can I interest you in the buzzword of these days everybody wants to talk about sustainable development these days it's the new thing that everybody wants to talk about and they want to say how we do more clean energy clean constructions and city housing um, just in terms of then your work and your experiences and the area that you're focused on around sustainability and physics at Borough uh, Harpel tell us a little bit more about that your role in that in terms of how we can make our cities more sustainable in a physical as well as a, a financial way as well. Sure. Um, firstly, I want to say it's just a huge honour to be on this panel with people who are talking so much sense and that I don't feel like I have to be the first one to bring up thorny issues. So that's just really wonderful. Um, so, uh, yeah, sustainable development. Um, bit bit of a, an oxymoron in a lot of ways, I guess. Um, and I think as... Um, as Deborah and Agamemnon, Agamemnon I will <laughs> struggle with that. It's such, a cool, name. Said, it's such a cool name, though, I have to it, say. It's Agamemnon. absolutely fantastic. I just can't say it really, really quickly yet. Um, it's, it's absolutely about the wider context, um, and that's what we find in our work as well. And so I suppose one of the things that I want to talk to you about is um, we've been doing a project with C40 cities. So this is a, a, a coalition of almost 100 cities all around the world. Um, and they have a program on at the moment called the Clean Construction Program, which is essentially around reducing the carbon embodied in the materials and um, processes that go towards building new buildings. So when you talk about the environmental uh, carbon footprint of the built environment, there are kind of two big categories. One is around the operational energies and carbon use. So, you know, the, um, the carbon that you uh, that is emitted because of heating, cooling, operating the buildings. And the other is the embodied carbon, so the carbon um, associated with those materials. And so the Clean Construction Programme is really about focusing on, on the embodied carbon, and then also as part of that, the emissions associated with construction sites themselves, because obviously a lot of construction machinery is sort of diesel powered and, and very polluting um, in all sorts of ways. So. I think uh, so um, we have been doing deep dive studies into six cities all around the world and we're, we're working on them still now but the, the three that we've finished so far are Toronto and I saw that there are some people here from Toronto, fantastic, um, and Milan and Mexico, cities, uh, Mexico City and one of the, the really interesting things about the way that this study has been carried out is because what we've done with each of these is start with understanding what are the city powers. Now I, I think you know as as um, other speakers have already said, we, we understand what the problem is. And I think it's really important to say that that problem is now. This is not a problem that we necessarily need to worry about in the future. We have problems right now that we need to be addressing immediately. Um, and in some ways, we know what we need to do from a technical perspective. You know, we know that we need to retrofit existing buildings. We need to um, creatively reuse existing buildings to um, create affordable homes. We need to have infrastructure in place. We need to have good planning systems and so on. Um, but the question is, how do we how do we get there? And one of the ways that we can get there from a city perspective is looking at the city powers. And every city has a different kind of um, uh, armory almost of, of powers that it might use. And so, you know, for example, building codes and standards, we found that Milan has a lot more capacity there in terms of its city powers than say Toronto or Mexico City. Municipal procurement though, all of those three cities have a huge um, ability to bring about change if they think about the way that they actually are procuring and 
um, procuring the buildings and the way that that changes the wider market. Um, Toronto, um, seeing as we've got some uh, friends here from there, you know, competitions and declarations and commitments that the city is able to, um, that, the, that, that the city can lead on, can make a big difference there. Whereas, for example, in Mexico City, it's a lot more about the creation of new infrastructure and assets. And so I, I think this is a really, really important lesson because, you know, as Deborah and Agamemnon have already said, you know, we, we're not going to solve this problem with extractive profit seeking. That's not how we're going to do this. But we do need to look at all of the powers that we have and whether that's because we're a municipality or we're a business or an individual. I think we need to start with understanding actually what power and agency do we have and how can we mobilize that and bring that to, to bear on, um, on tackling this issue. And that's a perfect segue to Melanie, who is from the chief executive from the British Property Federation, because she can now tell us a little bit more about the role of governance and the powers that, that exist in terms of trying to address the, the housing crisis and how to involve uh, all key stakeholders. Now, Melanie, I, I'm sitting in Malmesbury at the moment in a planning inquiry that is trying to give permission to uh, uh, 200 houses in this town and we've spent four days arguing with loads of parish councillors and loads of people about houses that should really come forward but but is being stopped for very various political uh, wrangling and, and housing land supply that I can bore everyone with um, issues but but in terms of governance, your, your reflections on that, because I tell you, if everything was smooth, I wouldn't have a job, but, but that's another story. Thank you, Hashi, uh, and good afternoon, everyone. And pity the poor person has to go last on such a stellar panel and such a fantastic range of views. You know, I've been nodding violently in agreement with all of my fellow panelists. I'll walk up to the answer to that, if I may, and remind me if I don't get there and get lost along the way. But just perhaps, I mean, firstly, to introduce the BPF is the membership organisation for uh, property in the UK. So I'm speaking very much from a UK perspective. Um, and... I don't represent the major house builders, so uh, I'm not going to talk about you know, the house building, building uh, for sale model. Um, but what I do represent, and I think this is sort of um, partly in response to where Deborah started in terms of you know, the market uh, can't deliver all solutions with which I absolutely agree. And I think Smith also touched on it too, but what I do represent is, is, is new, genuinely new money that's come into the housing supply uh, chain over the last few years in the form of uh, the build to rent sector, which is now um, over 100 and, uh, 200 thousand strong in terms of adding to housing supply. And that's not money that you know, would have been invested in housing at all before. Um, and it's providing better quality rental homes, uh, broadly comparable to the, um, the pricing offer and the demographic that's actually taking up build to rent to what you see in the private rented sector generally. Um, but with, we think, a much higher standard of amenities available to residents, a much higher standard and quality of building, uh, and, and places that people can call homes, places that uh, investors want to let for the long term, so people can, with confidence, um, call a rental home their home. Uh, and that's families as well as singles and uh, couples in town and city centres. Uh, so that's the first constituency I represent. The second one then is that a lot of it is overlapping. A lot of that same institutional money is trying to find ways to be a partner to government and a part of the solution to delivering more affordable and social housing, whether that's through for-profit housing associations, whether that's partnering with housing associations. So there is long-term patient capital trying to be part of the solution to this. Uh, and part of what government can do is create the right vehicles and incentives to make that happen. Because it's all, it's all ultimately a virtuous circle because it's our money in pensions funds and savings funds and invest in, in insurance funds. And they're trying to reinvest that in our communities uh, and to provide futures for our families and our uh, future generations. So there is a real virtuous circle there that I think we've only just started to explore how we can unlock the potential of that. Uh, but then the third part of the constituency that I represent is, is a bunch of people uh, who own a lot of assets in town and city centres that are currently shops <laughs> and restaurants 
um, and won't be, and, and may, may not be now, or won't, certainly won't be in five or 10 years time because COVID has accelerated the trend we were seeing beforehand of the retail physical footprint shrinking in towns and cities across the UK. And all of those buildings need to be repurposed. We need to find new uses for them. You know, and we're much less likely than we would have been five years ago to just knock them down and rebuild from scratch. We're much more likely to be thinking about repurposing them in a way that's more sustainable. Uh, so there's a huge opportunity, actually, because we've got lots of buildings and space in town and city centres uh, that we need to find new uses for. And homes should absolutely be a fundamental part of that mix. But it has to be a mix. It has to be the creation of great town and city centres that people want to live in, can work in, want to relax in, want to come into to, to socialise. So there's a huge opportunity there. The risk in it and I say this as a representative of the real estate industry, the risk is that we do that in a poor way that actually just converts quite poor office uh, and other stock into quite poor homes. So again, government has a role to play, I think, in being the gatekeeper of that. And we would be the first to say that's a good thing. We have to make sure we do that in a way which creates good quality town centres and good quality homes for people, not just repurposing poor stock into a different kind of poor use. So that's my walk up to the question, Hashi. Um, and where it leaves me, I think, is that par fund partnerships are fundamental to this. You can't create a vibrant town centre with homes at the heart that people want to live in, can afford to live in, and are good quality for them, unless you've got, on the one hand, a local authority with a clear vision for how they're going to create that place. You've got private sector, par sector partners wanting to come in and partner that uh, with capital that they want to invest for the long term. And you may need mechanisms to help drive some of that, particularly in places where residential values aren't going to support a, a wholly commercial proposition to redevelop. So in parts of the country, that rate, the housing market's really strong, residential values are high. The market broadly will sort this for itself. It will find those opportunities. In other parts of the country, residential values are low. You're not gonna create an investable proposition for the private sector on its own. So you're going to need both a committed local authority with a vision to really make this happen, but also, with levers it can pull to help that. One of the things we've uh, put to government is the idea of something called town centre investment zones. So you create a, a ring fence zone within which a local authority has powers for, you know, to, and the teeth and the confidence to use their compulsory purchase orders, for example, to knock heads together, to bring partners together, who you basically either say to them, you know, if you want to have skin in this game, you have to be part of a group that's collectively working to manage this area and create the right uh, conditions within it or if you don't want to be then that's fine you know, we'll buy you out you leave and we'll bring in other partners who do want to be part of that so I think yeah. there are there are models that you can create to bring those partnerships together that will help to drive yeah. uh, those solutions and, and thank you very much for that uh, Melanie to to Dr Potts can I just explore something you said earlier which was um, in relation to the problem being one around the labour market I'm very interested in exploring that with you because one of the things that I am always interested in and concerned at the same time about is how whether you're in Toronto, Vancouver, London or Paris, any major city in the Western Hemisphere, what you tend to find is something that you alluded to earlier, that so much land, so much property and so many developments are not necessarily seen as a place that somebody could one day call home, but are actually the pension fund investments. They are the places that people will put their money in because they know that's where their money will be safe. There are, they are places where people will see as essentially a way of securing their future rather than a place that somebody could one day call home, build a life, build a future and build memories. And so when you think about that picture of what that, that role of what that plays in terms of understanding the crisis that we're faced with, could you just tell me a little bit more about where you are on that and, and how you see that part of the picture and what role does that play? Because you can be earning loads of money, but if none of these properties actually come on the market for you to be able to buy one day, what use is that in, in one sense? So I, I'd like your reflections on that. Yeah, I mean, I think it has been <clears throat> a, a major element <clears throat> of pushing up prices uh, since 2008. I mean, the, the, the 
But let's remember the prices were going up before that. That was partly because of the deregulation. Deregulation has been actually central to driving the prices up at the end of the last century into this century. Then there was the crash. Uh, and we still got de deregulated markets and so on. And then, of course, the reasons that I explained, um, people seeking for safe um, havens and safe, uh, profitable outlets for their for their capital, um, because putting into government bonds and so on, is, you know, they're, they're paying very little. I think one has to be careful, however, and colleagues of mine at King's College London in our, our our research group is, is called Future Cities, funnily enough. Um, they have shown really that that although you've certainly got um, you know lots of money going to really really high end, very very expensive luxury apartments, very very high rise, and so on, and that that is part of it. In fact, that doesn't really have an absolutely direct impact on uh, the people say in the bottom 50% or 40% or 30%, it depends on which city you're in, who are in the housing dilemma and really can't afford anything. Because it's not really pushing the prices up of, let me put it this way, the flat next door to me in Haringey, where I am now, Haringey. Hang on, hang on there, hang on there, hang on there. Is that right? Is that right? Because I, I know that anecdotally and, and mm. in some research that the people, for example, a lot of barristers, who would normally have lived in zone one 20 years ago mm, mm. are now buying places in Walthamstow. Yeah. So who's who's not being able to buy in Walthamstow now? Oh, sorry. I, I say it's always Walthamstow. So there's, <laughs> there's, that's always the example. I love that. Yes, or no, Brixton, you are, or no, Brixton, you, you're, or no, Brixton no, where no, Agamemnon is. The point you're making is absolutely right. But what I'm saying is that, it, that, that building that place in Knightsbridge, whatever it's called, number one Knightsbridge, wasn't the market thing that caused that because this is just a very high end, very peculiar thing that's going on. It was putting money into more ordinary types of properties, if you like, expensive properties, but not the ones that tend to be the ones that are flagged up in the media, I suppose I'm saying. Um, and also in uh, here in Britain, and of course it, every country has its own policies and so on, but here in Britain, up until quite recently, a couple of years ago, there was tremendous government policy towards encouraging buy to let. Um, yes. So they were getting huge tax dodges. I'm oh, sorry, I should pass, I shouldn't use the word dodge. Tax breaks, sorry. Um, and incentives, that, incentives, incentives, incentives. That's the word. Incentives. That's the word um, which encouraged lots of people to put money into properties that they, they would then rent out. And of course, we have a very deregulated rental sector as well. Um, and that had a huge impact in London. And, and also, it's the big cities, it's the Manchesters and so on, because now those the property prices going up in places like Manchester and Birmingham, Edinburgh and so on. Um, and that, so that all those policies you need to look at and think, well, those are pushing prices up. They have definitely pushed prices up. So you've got the chronic condition, which is, you know, people in the bottom, I would say at least 40% if we're talking about London. And then you've got a bunch of people perhaps in the income distribution around the middle, the 40 to 60, 70% of income distribution. And they are being pushed down towards the housing dilemma. And as you rightly say, there's a geography to it because lots of people, barristers, you make the example of, I could say university lecturers are being pushed out to Orthamstow. Um, we'll take that as a shorthand. So it has, it's like a ripple effect. Yeah, exactly. You know? um, exactly. I totally totally agree with you. I think you're absolutely right. But I think that sort of highlighting sometimes some of this very, very high end stuff, there's a sort of transnational circuitry of stuff that yeah. goes on that almost doesn't, you know, touch uh, the sides. And they don't pay any tax either. I don't care if I say that, I mean it. <laughs> no, I completely agree with you. And there's so much more. I, I, I'm not going to suggest that it's all about the sort of Saudis buying in, in Knightsbridge that's causing all the problems. Yeah. It's a big part of the problem. And there are so many other factors, banks, local communities, councils mm -hmm. not building enough, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So there's loads of that uh, around as well. But Agamemnon, just building on the co-op world, I'm, I'm involved in, um, in I'm a, one of the trustees of the um, Coin Street co-op, mm -hmm. which um, uh, you may know about uh, on the South Bank. And one of the things we've been facing and the discussions we've been having around there is, and I know this sounds, may sound horrible, but how we get people to move on. There are people who've been living in the co-ops for over 20 years and 
they may now be able to actually afford market housing because their children can afford market housing. But there are people now who need those co-ops, but will not have access to them because many of these co-ops are either full or the waiting list is too long. How do we tackle that moral dilemma in one sense, but also a practical one? This is um, a slight red herring in the sense that um, government policy would be dealing with about 95 to 97% of the social housing um, area of that. So I think it is a, it's a policy perspective, whereas this is a, particularly in the UK when you have um, one particular party is very hell bent on making sure that um, councils are not allowed to own and build new houses and have to put them up for sale. Um, and another party is trying to consistently allow the councils to build their own housing stock and then be able to subsidize for people. I think there needs to be a turnover for, uh, absolutely there needs to be a turnover policy where um, the housing stock, which one builds, then allows new ones in. But <clears throat> I want to please not try to go off on a separate tangent, which means that somehow co-ops have to then fulfill the the, no, the obligations no, I, of the national government. I promise you, I promise okay. you, I wasn't. I only picked up the co-ops because of my own experience oh, no, no, and no. yours experience. Yeah, by course. the way, the problem of not allowing local authorities to have uh, own money and build more is a labor as well as a conservative problem. So don't let labor off. Labor were in power. I didn't say any. I didn't say didn't any. Enough. You made it political. I didn't use any political party. No, no, I'm making it political. Uh, okay, okay. They're all as bad as each other. Okay. Well, I, I, but I want to I want to go I want to touch on two points, which is one is that um, a, a the the labor discussion, which which opened this, but Deborah opened this discussion with sort of labor labor movements and how we I think that the fundamental issue here is that by outsourcing a great deal of labor, we've then basically stolen from the past and stolen from future by destabilizing the markets here. If we were paying for the actual outcomes. Of, of, the, of the clothing that is being made, we wouldn't be getting it cheaper elsewhere because we are, it, the, the, the reason why people don't have as much money as they w could is because the labor markets have been deep destabilized by really effectively going to other places and having them make them for cheaper. But then who is the person who is the worst off is the environment. The environment has been taking all that extra carbon to move those thousands of tons of cotton underwear and and all the building materials which used to be made in the uk and are no longer therefore you have this destabilization of the market so when we talk about like market destabilization we can't really focus on one area or not without looking at a holistic sustainable perspective yeah. and i think one of the key elements of that is to think about there you know there's a lot of talk in the chat around around sustainable materials and how best to build and and i did my master's in architecture for advanced environment and energy studies right so very specifically, I would say that a passive house um, principle, not passive house, the company, but passive houses, you know, with passive th solar gain are fantastic and you should use all sustainable materials. But I think the real key here is to talk about holistic, the holistic perspective about where placemaking. And it's not Absolutely. just about the built environment, it, the house with the material, but it's actually around that. How do we create green spaces mm -hmm. where people want to be? Because that's the key thing here is that cities take away all the negative stuff there are incredible opportunity for people to come together to enjoy to 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 have to be completely financially um emotionally um and and physically spiritually empowered and in a better place because you know we as uh, can do better if the environment itself and i go back to that point around smart cities versus socially smart cities has people who are engaged and involved from the very physical material all the way through, then we can talk about a really regenerative, just transformation of cities and the housing infrastructure. Thank you very much. Um, um, to, to, over to you, Smith and Deborah, just, uh, Dr. Potts has just made the point about the pro one of the issues about co-ops is to try and scale them up more. And I couldn't agree with you more. Smith, your reaction on any of, uh, any of this stuff that we're talking about and potentially what other solutions that might be brought to the table? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think um, one other thing that comes to mind in the, um, discussion around co-ops as well is um, that we need to facilitate a much broader range of models for living together. Um, not only that heteronormative nuclear family everywhere, everywhere, everywhere is so enshrined physically in like um, in, in, in our housing stock. Um, and that's that's not only um, 
very kind of reductive in terms of different ways that we might live together and different ways that we might love and different ways that we form families and so on. Um, but also in terms of uh, being able to live sustainably, being able to share more, being able to share more infrastructure, share more, more things. Um, and so that, you know, creating cities that are livable and where everybody has a sort of safe and sustainable and affordable place to live is also about making sure that people have access to, you know, somebody talked about food security in the chat, um, but, you know, access to food, healthcare, schools, public transport and so on, and living so that we share more and are able to share things is, is, is central to that. Um, and so I think that that's another thing that's really, really important. And because of the way that um, homes have become these sort of hyper commodified units, it, we want them to be separate so that you can sell them and buy them separately and so on. And that it's, that's much more complicated when you have um, ways of living together differently. And I think that would be another kind of a, a hopeful thing that we could see in, the, in, in the very, very, very near future, please. I mean, it's obviously, it or does already exist, but all of these solutions, these like nowtopias that do already exist, we want to see many, many, many more of them. And then you wouldn't need people to move out of your car because they'd, they'd be fine. There'd be millions of cars. Yeah. Thank you. And and just in Melanie, I, I was interested to just explore one thing that you mentioned earlier. I'm conscious of the time, so I'm going to try and get one more round of all of you guys saying something. But you mentioned the built to rent market one of which is not far from where I live, the, the Quintain model in Wembley, which I, I think, but, but is that really a sustainable way forward given how expensive it is? One of the Quintain sort of flats is like close to sort of 2000 pounds. You know, who's earning 2000 pounds to live in one of those flats in, in a place like Wembley? Not many people, I would have, I would have thought. So I can't speak to that particular example, but we've just published and I'll, um, if I can manage to multitask well enough to put it in the chat, I'll do it, I'll, I'll send it to you to talk to us afterwards. We've just published some uh, new research on who's actually living in build to rent. Um, and, you know, there will, of course, there will be, there'll be outliers, but in general terms, um, who lives in build to rent is pretty much uh, the same demographic as the people who are living in the private rented sector generally. One in five are public sector. Um, you know, they're, they're paying uh, slightly more than uh, the private rented sector generally, but broadly benchmarking similar levels of money. But for that, they're getting a much better offer. They're getting community spaces, they're getting, you know, uh, concierges, they're getting roof gardens. Now that's not for everybody, but it's a product that is a higher quality. So. Um, so in general, uh, our research shows that build to rent benchmarks broadly uh, against the private rental sector generally, um, but it's not a solution to creating affordable and social housing for people who can only dream of, you know, private renting as well, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not pretending to be, it's, it's, def it's clearly not a solution to that, to that challenge, but it is uh, both an addition uh, to the private rented market for those who can afford to privately rent uh, and driving up standards in the PRS. And I think, you know, standards in the private rental sector in this country, and I'm sure it's not unique across the globe, you know, have been frankly dreadful, you know, and still are in, in too many places. And um, that deregulation that one of the, my colleague panelists talked about, you know, that, that, is part of, that is part of why we've got to that position. Um, so we're really supportive of the government's drive to try and you know, increased standards in the private rented sector generally, but but built to rent is a is a, is a product that is specifically designed yeah. to achieve that. Mm. Thank you. And uh, people agreeing with your point on there, Agamemnon, about uh, placemaking and how to think about this differently. So we've got three minutes, and I've got the same question for all of you, um, Dr. Potts. If you were, thankfully, probably not Boris Johnson, but if you were in a powerful position today. Um, what would well Agamemnon's a king, I guess, so he's got real power. But what would you have do, Dr. Pops, in terms of one thing that you would advise, whether it's policy or, or legal or anything that you that you think might make a really big difference in the short to medium term? All right. If it's the short to the medium term, then I would say this: uh, I would interrogate every single instance of the use of the term affordable in any housing project or program that is being put out there, because most of the time it's what I call poor washing. They say this is affordable, but when you look at it, it is no longer what used to be understood as affordable in the past across the world, but in Britain for now we say 80% of market rent. This is not affordable to most people, 
who are having problems. So it's not affordable. So I, that would be my thing is always ask, what does this mean? And then say, what are the sort of local incomes around here? And you've already asked that actually, Hashi, it's exactly the question you asked. Is it meaningful? Is this really an affordable housing project? And push on that and push on it and don't give up. That would be Thank my you. short term. Thing. Thank you. And King Agamemnon, your, your day, your one big decision in the short to medium term. Uh, I would have all um, building follow in the UK um, have the rule uh, that everything had to be sourced and built with the embedded carbon in it. So all of the sort of um, the sort of stream one, two, and three embedded carbon had to be at a minimum level. Um, tell us, and for then, those of us who don't understand what that means, embedded carbon. Tell us what that what that what that means. So, so basically, there are the the big companies out there. They generate a tons of carbon um, in their daily activities. But then they are then they have all of the the transport of getting their materials to them, and then they have all of their downstream businesses that they that they own and they their subsidiaries that deliver and have all those carbon emissions. So when you get materials, so. All of that has to be factored into the building fabric of the built environment of this in, in a citywide way, and that all of the investment that comes in has to be um, uh, created in a way in which the reasonable returns over a reasonable amount of time is factored in. It can't be these this sort of fast gains and get out, so that it's a long term investment. Um, that's my decree. Thank you very much. And to, over to you, Smith. Um, your uh, powerful uh, idea in the short to medium term. Sure. So I'm going to go with Queen because that's a good like gender neutral combo of King and Queen. Um, oh no! <laughs> not my... not in the Greek. Not in the well. The Greek world probably did have it, but, but uh, we 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 skewed it. But anyway, sorry. Um, of course, uh, it wouldn't be a um, uh, dictatorship. But anyway, um, my decree would be to acknowledge that we do not need uh, to raise taxes in order to um, fund public spending. And therefore, I would um, create lots of lovely money and um, use it to retrofit our existing buildings. Um, Sorry, you would raise taxes? No, I would not raise taxes. You would not? We don't need to raise taxes. And I would um, have acknowledged that we do not need to raise taxes in order to increase public spending. Right. OK. And then where would the money come from? In, well, our, in our understanding of how it works now. Well, how long have you got? But <laughs> we, have, we, we have monetary sovereignty. We are able to create our own currency. Okay, so we can enough. create we can create money. We still will need to sort out our taxes in order to deal with inequality and inflation, but that's not a problem because we can tax the wealthy. But in any case, we will create the public. To, we will to retrofit. Sorry, I interrupted you. But to there. retrofit our existing buildings. Now, both retrofit our existing homes, but also adaptive reuse of existing buildings to create additional homes um, and to make sure that um, everybody has a safe and secure home. Thank you very much. And to you, Melanie, um, please, your idea of what could change things immediately in the short to medium term. Um, so I would devolve more powers to the local authorities that have shown that they're capable of using them uh, and would use them if they had the chance. And I would invest in upskilling the other local authorities to get to the same level because housing needs to be delivered by local communities with local communities and local views and voices at its heart so we shouldn't try and do it from the center you know both you and agamemnon picked this up and uh, if i was to pick thing, something it would be very related to what you guys have talked about in relation to giving more power to local authorities and the two things i'd do is i would double their planning and, and development management teams overnight and I'd give them the power to be able to actually borrow money and start building houses themselves like they used to. Mm. That tomorrow makes such a big difference instead of having to rely on developers to do these things. But anyway, I have really, really enjoyed this discussion. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, Dr. Deborah Potts, the author of Broken Cities Inside the Global Housing Crisis. Agamemnon Otero, the CEO of Energy Garden, co-founder of Repowering Brixton Energy and Community Energy England. And we also have uh, heard from um, uh, the um, 
uh, from Smith, Director of Sustainability and Physics, um, Burrow Harpold, and of course to uh, Melanie uh, uh, Leach, the Chief Executive of the British Property uh, Federation. So thank you very much all. Thank you to Tortoise for organizing this. Thank you to everyone who's been listening globally, especially those uh, uh, who are in Canada. I love Canada. Uh, it's like a nicer place and a bigger place than, than the UK. Um, but, um, but thank you very much, everyone, and have a lovely evening.